Friday morning, April 17th. The Apollo 13 astronauts were minutes away from a plunge back into Earth's atmosphere that would heat up the outside of their capsule to as much as 5,000 degrees. You know, around the world, as this spacecraft hurtles back toward Earth this morning, uh, their prayers are being said, and they have been said ever since the explosion on Monday night, and the world learned of the jeopardy in which uh, these space flyers were, the worst in space yet. People have been watching the events shown on the large screen here in the main room at Grand Central all morning. I think they need a lot of luck and a lot of prayers, and I think we'll bring them home safely. Yeah, I guess I feel the same way everybody else does. They're our boys. I want them back. Bye-bye. Blackout and reentry time approaching now as the uh, USS Iwo Jima moves quietly uh, through the South Pacific. At 11.52 a.m., radio signals from Odyssey were cut off as the spacecraft hit the atmosphere at a blistering 25,000 miles per hour. Practically all the ship personnel are on the deck, uh, looking out over the side with glasses, peering up into the sun. The weather almost perfect. And it will be now just a matter of minutes. The sailors could not yet see it, but Odyssey was engulfed in a 5,000 degree fireball generated by atmospheric friction. Moments before re-entry, Swigert had thanked Mission Control for all their help, almost as if he wanted to get it on the record in case he and the crew did not survive. I know all of us here want to thank uh, all you guys down there for the very fine job you did. That's the firm, Joe. Was Odyssey's protective heat shield intact? Flight controllers nervously stood by. They had little choice. There was nothing anyone could do about a bad heat shield. It would either work or it wouldn't. Apollo 13 uh, should have entered uh, the Earth's atmosphere at this time. As the minutes tick away, the prime recovery ship here in the South Pacific goes into a strange sort of quiet. This is the moment, and everyone aboard knows it. The ones who have the critical assignments move about with a silent precision that is almost deafening. The uh, period of blackout uh, for the spacecraft should have begun about uh, 20 some odd seconds ago. And that radio blackout caused by the hot gas enveloping Odyssey was expected to last about four minutes. Less than 10 seconds now, uh, we will attempt to uh, contact Apollo 13 uh, through one of the Araya aircraft. Four minutes had come and gone, and still no word from Apollo 13. Apollo 13 should be uh, out of blackout at this time. Uh, we're standing by for any reports of Araya acquisition. Finally, We've had a report that Araya 4 aircraft uh, has acquisition of signal. And then, the words the flight controllers and the world had been desperately waiting for. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Okay, go. Okay, we read you, Jack. Odyssey's heat shield had done its job. Now it was up to the capsule's parachutes. Less than uh, 30 seconds away now from uh, drogue deployment. Uh, Standing by now, continuing to monitor. They see it? Oh, they they can see it. A report of uh, two good drogues coming up now for main shoots. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the mains. It really looks great. Apollo 13 is uh, practically on the dime here in the uh, South Pacific. And uh, gliding uh, ever so uh, quietly down. Just a beautiful sight to see. About 15 seconds away from landing. Oh, boy. We finally breathed a sigh of relief when the spacecraft, going at a very slow speed now, sliced very nicely into the water. There's the splashdown. Uh, then we looked at each other and said, you know, we made it. Apollo 15, back home. Another cheer in the control room as we had splashdown. Well, the one at this time, the uh, are in the water. 
And there's Odyssey, the end of the Odyssey. It was 12.07 p.m. The jubilant flight controllers could finally relax after four days of unbearable tension. So all the long hours and the days of waiting, watching, and worrying by the whole world are over. And what a beautiful ending. Everything today went as smoothly and as simply as it had so often uh, gone badly since that first terrifying accident on Monday night. The first astronaut is uh, climbing out of the command module. Divers helped the astronauts get out of the capsule. They were quickly picked up to be ferried to the nearby Iwo Jima. And there are all three of them aboard. Say they're feeling fine on the helicopter. Three men who three or four days ago, uh, well, the odds weren't uh, too high, perhaps, that they'd be making this flight today, but they made it. Hayes, who was suffering from a serious kidney infection, was sent to the infirmary. All three astronauts had lost weight, an average of more than 10 pounds each, and all three were disoriented and numb from fatigue. Nonetheless, and understandably, they were in high spirits, as were their families. I'm just very thankful and very humble, and I just, I want to thank everyone at Mission Control. He looked so great, and we were so thankful, of course, for having that now. It's a wonderful beginning, a beautiful ending, but I wouldn't give you a two hoops for the interim. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, it's a very proud day for the three of us to be back here, to be back on Earth again. Just as Fred and Jack and I tried to work as a team up there, we had hundreds of people on the ground that really saw to it that we got back home safely. So on behalf of the three of us, we're glad to be home and we're glad to be part of America. Despite the successful return of Apollo 13, the failure of the mission raised new questions about the cost and the safety of the moon program. An investigation was launched and the review board quickly focused on the history of the oxygen tank that had exploded. This is an Apollo oxygen tank, one precisely like the tank that exploded in equipment bay number four of Apollo 13. It appeared they were paying very close attention to anything, any part that might have heated up, setting off the explosion. As it turned out, the tank had a tortured history. Internal heaters and fans had the wrong kind of safety switches. They fused shut during a launch pad test two weeks before takeoff, and as a result, internal temperatures climbed to more than 1,000 degrees, burning away the Teflon insulation on wires inside the tank. No one knew on April 13th, when Swigert turned on the fans and stirred the tanks, that a spark would jump, setting off a bomb. I think if we had lost that crew, very possibly the entire lunar program would have certainly uh, slowed down a heck of a lot more and possibly even ceased. And I believe that uh, we, just by the skin of our, our fingernails sometimes, uh, kept that mission on track. You know, if we had died out there, uh, it would have been a long time before anybody else had gone to the moon. The Apollo 13 astronauts never flew in space again. Lovell and Hayes worked on the space shuttle program before retiring from NASA and going into private industry. Jack Swiger tried his hand at politics, and was elected to the House of Representatives in 1982, but he died of cancer three days before his swearing in the following January. When the 20th century returns, the legacy of Apollo 13. Jim Lovell, Fred Hayes, Jack Swigert returned to Earth heroes, explorers who had risked everything to chart a dangerous new frontier. America's reborn pride in its space program, in its ability to snatch three brave men back from the brink of death, prompted parades and celebrations. But the euphoria quickly faded. After the Apollo 13 accident investigation, flights resumed in January of 1971 with the launch of Apollo 14. But NASA never seemed to regain its past glory. And on December 19th of 1972, Apollo 17 returned to Earth 
ending humanity's initial exploration of the moon. It was one of the great adventures of human history. For the public and for many at NASA, the six successful moon flights would mark the agency's greatest triumph. But for the flight controllers who nursed NASA's most successful failure back to Earth, Apollo 13 was their sternest test. Never before or since have astronauts come so close to death in space and lived to tell the tale. I'm Mike Wallace, and this is the 20th century. Now available from a and &E Home Video, 20th Century with Mike Wallace. Re-examine some of the significant events of this century and see how they will continue to affect our future. Call 1-800-423-1212. And for $99.95 plus shipping and handling, you can own this collector's set. 11 episodes on five video cassettes of 20th Century with Mike Wallace. Call now, 1-800-423-1212. I'm Mike Wallace, November 22nd, 1963, a day seared in America's memory, the assassination of John Kennedy on the next 20th century. Next Wednesday, only on A&E. They're one of the world's most famous flight squadrons. Experience the thrill, precision, and artistry of the Blue Angels, Sunday, in an A&E special presentation. Now, a store owner claims self-defense after gunning down two would-be robbers. Is he a victim? or a vigilante. Find out on Law & Order, next on A&A. &E.